Before we get to your scheduled video, please remember that likes and comments tell YouTube to promote our work to other people, and subscribing to the channel tells you when something new drops. You can also head to the link tree in the description to peruse my books, join us on Discord, or support us on Patreon. You can get episodes of Journey of Wrestling and Violent Profiles early, as well as a load of other treats. Even just a dollar a month earns you a name drop for being cool. Thanks for listening, and enjoy the show. Greetings and salutations, fellow dogs, good and bad. It is I, Eric J. Chucky, joined as always by... The Boy. Hey. This is the Two Nerds Podcast. Today we're talking about Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3, the final entry in the Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy. Uh, at the very least, James Gunn's Guardians of the Galaxy trilogy. Uh, there well, may be more Guardians movies after this. The MCU is an unstoppable monster. But this is the end of this story. It will also end the trilogy. If you add a fourth one, it's not a trilogy anymore. It becomes a saga, I believe, at that point. Quadrilogy. No, I'm going with saga. Quintology is the next one. I'm going And then, with... sextology. Speaking of sextology, you know who's cool? I don't like this. I don't like this at all. I'm not participating in this. Well, a guy from Ohio. Uh, Passion Killer 7-Eleven. And I have it on good authority, Rob. <laughs> Something I overheard once. Uh, <laughs> Today we're talking about the Guardians of the Galaxy movie. <laughs> uh, I, I, uh, hmm. Well, how do we want to approach this beast? So, I think standard structure is probably best. Um,. Go episode by episode. <laughs> uh, Spoiler-free review, general thoughts, and then get into the details. So, what is your spoiler-free general overview review for Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3? I think if you like the first two movies, it's important to see this one. Uh, our window is open. If you hear tiny dogs, you're welcome. Yeah, they're great. They're fucking adorable. Um, that's my spoiler-free review. Uh, not the tiny dogs part, the the part where if you saw the first two, I think it's it would behoove you to see this one. Finish the fight, as it were. Um, I would say if you like the first two, you will probably like this, but it's not a guarantee. Um, and this is... I, st- I wouldn't say this is a spoiler, this is very much a general thing. A lot of ends of trilogies are climactic they're they're increases they're they're like uh you know the biggest threat the biggest stakes all that this is much more of an emotional uh climax an emotional resolution than like uh guardians of, uh, than like uh, the pirates of the caribbean at world's end big bombastic like fight in a tor- fight in a tornado sort of thing well and i i feel like you you hit the nail on the head and i had similar thoughts at the time when we discussed this after seeing the film um Privately, obviously, we're discussing it after seeing the film with you guys now. But uh, it that was um, Endgame. Yeah, Endgame was the was the at world's end. Endgame was the big bombastic, the highest possible stakes. They're fighting for the fate of the whole universe. That was that for the Guardians of the Galaxy. And uh, most of the MCU at the time. Yeah, um, and there's no real way to go up from. Uh, trillions upon trillions upon trillions, uh, infin- an uncalculable number of lives hang in the balance, fighting for the fate of the very universe in which you uh, operate, uh, in combination with all of the other heroes of import from your entire story arc of 20 movies over 20 years. Uh, you can't really, there's no up from that, so they went with a smaller, more contained story. It's still. Big explosions and shit still happen, but it's not nearly as high stakes. It's much more of a emotional resolution. Uh, it's a more dour film as well. Not to say that it's without humor. Yeah, it's certainly not the second Black Panther movie. Sure, That sure. is, to date, the most dour MCU movie. And even that had uh, jokes. That's not good. Yeah. No, uh, <laughs> but... um. I... I, I think it is emotional, I think is the right word for it. This is a uh, uh, last ride into the sunset kind of thing, more than, you know, pretty festival fireworks. Yeah, and, and if that sounds at all interesting to you, you'll really like this. 
if that sounds concerning, but you like the first two movies, as White said, finish the fight. You want to see this, but I can't guarantee you're going to walk away having had an amazing time. Um, <sighs> Did you have anything else you wanted to mention before we, we slowly oh, no, I'd say that's, I'd say that's, that, that's about all I needed to say from a spoiler free. I wanted to give people a correct perspective on this movie insofar as my ability to judge film is concerned because I feel like I feel like the trailers oversold how sad this movie was gonna be I agree but I would rather have been oversold that than anything else that's fair um I had a personal journey with this one uh I'm gonna try not to self-indulge too much I mean it is my show and I can do whatever the fuck I want but uh you know for the sake of uh Viewer retention. Uh, that little metric on my YouTube studio screen. Um, I, I was having a rough time going into this one. You know, obviously this movie was pushed back at least three years. Uh, and the nature of the universe uh, that we live in uh, caused that pushback. And then also probably caused several changes to the story as a result of that pushback. Uh, certainly, one way or the other. I mean, I feel like this was definitely the way things were going to go in some form or fashion from the start. I absolutely think that James Gunn had this planned. Uh, but small things, and maybe medium things, got altered along the way. Um, absolutely, for example, Adam Warlock, he was supposed to be in the second movie like as a strong presence. Didn't happen. So this movie ended up being a little bit different. Yeah. Um, but uh, as for my personal journey, I, I was expecting... Eh, expecting is not the right word. I... I Assumed? Yes. I assumed the third movie was going to be similar in tone to the first two. And uh, it wasn't until the first trailer dropped and I managed to see it, because as long-time listeners know, I don't like to watch trailers. Um, you don't seek them out. They tend to spoil more than they tease. I don't uh, I don't generally at this point like, give a crap about spoilers, but like... The only trailers I'm going to look up are movies I'm not sure I want to see. If I already know I want to see the movie, a trailer does nothing for me. Yes, that is fair. Uh, I'm glad I saw this one. It gave me time to prepare. Um, if you if this had been sprung on you, that would have been a very different situation. I, I would have been a lot more stressed in the theater. Um, and, and that's kind of what happened, is that uh, the trailer warned me that this was going to be kind of a downbeat. And I was like, I don't know that I'm ready for that. Um, you know, I kind of forgot in the time since how much, when we watched the first Guardians, I mean, we do talk about, it, it is a meme among our, you know, listener base, uh, and us as well, don't do the Guardians of the Galaxy podcast. We loved the Guardians of the Galaxy movie so much so that we put out a genuinely terrible, unlistenable podcast, where we basically just did bad, like, renditions of every line in the movie. Uh, that's not helpful, that's not interesting. But that's how much we loved it. And I remember saying at the time, this was a time between, uh, this was before the sequel trilogy, that it felt nice to finally have a new Star Wars. Yeah. And uh, it's definitely different in tone from Star Wars. I mean, it wasn't made in the 70s, first of all. James Gunn has a famous quote about this. Okay. Uh, he said when he went to, when he uh, started to make Guardians of the Galaxy, he didn't want to make Star Wars. He wanted to make a movie that would make him, that would make his audience feel like he felt when he watched Star Wars as a kid. And I think he nailed that. Uh, and with me as an adult watching this film, it was, I, I remember that day more clearly than I remember a lot of things from that decade or so of my life. Um, going to see it, everything that happened around it, most of the day I had afterward, working at Walmart and just thinking about how great Guardians of the Galaxy was. That, uh, yeah, I mean, that movie's going to stick with me. Yeah. Um, and especially in a time where I find my fondness for Star Wars, my childhood Star Wars, uh, unlike some people whose Guardians of the Galaxy is their childhood Star Wars. If Guardians of the Galaxy is your childhood Star Wars, you probably, you're probably too young for this podcast. Oh, buddy. Oh, no. Time. Uh, time. <coughs> it hurts. Uh, regardless, uh, I... I I have a hard time enjoying everything Star Wars these days, or thinking as fondly about it as I used to, and man, uh, saying goodbye to this trilogy, to most of this cast, to 
probably James Gunn in a Marvel capacity. Nothing's written in stone, and a lot of people, except for Zoe Saldana, have said that they would love to come back and do stuff. And I don't, I don't begrudge Zoe for that. She spent a goodly portion of her career and probably her the role she's most known for, either behind a big CGI wall or in paint. It's perfectly reasonable to go want to do more serious acting. That's not un that's not unfair of her. But most of the rest of the cast will probably, you know, stick around for cameos. Dave's probably done. Because he's, you know, heading towards retirement in general, as far as I'm aware. Well, I mean, I think he's still acting, but he wants to do drama. He doesn't want to just be a big goober all the time. And you know what? That's, again, that's super fair. Yeah. I, I More power to you, Big Dave. Uh, but, like, the, uh, the if not most of the cast, some of the cast, and more importantly... This unit, this family, we're, this movie is saying goodbye to them. They're, th- this is a spoiler, uh, fair warning, by the end of this movie, the Guardians of the Galaxy have an almost entirely new roster. Uh, and that... That's part of life, is moving on to the next stage of your life. And that's also part of why this definitely feels like the fourth film and not the end of a trilogy. Because it is that transition, that question mark bridge into the new tomorrow. You know, even if we never get another film, you can imagine the adventures that the people who are the Guardians of the Galaxy by the end of things are going to go on. Yeah, it's very much, this movie very much ends with a new beginning. Yes. Several new beginnings. Yes, and I like that. I think that's great. I think it's a very... Because, you know, like all MC movies, MCU movies, this is a family movie. This is, to a certain extent, a kid's movie. But this is a very mature message for that sort of film. Um, because, like... Recognizing the ending of a thing as not inherently bad, as an opportunity for growth is something that even uh, that I struggled with even into adulthood. That's that's a mature message to to put across for a kids movie. And I really liked it. You know, speaking of kids movies, um well, let's pivot a little bit from our, our personal uh feelings on the movie just for a second uh and talk more about the movie itself. I really feel like this reminded me, especially in hindsight, in, in you know analysis that I performed afterward, uh, it reminded me of kids' movies from my childhood. In the way, especially like a Don Bluth thing, that it's kind of dark. Secret of Nim, I suppose I could... Uh, yeah, uh, the, the kind of movie that, while it is for the family, it's an all-ages experience, uh, they're, they don't shy away from... Bad shit happens in the world. And bad people exist, and they do horrible things. And sometimes for no good reason. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I, I liked that. And the more the more I think about it, the more... You know, I drew an illusion between this movie and Toy Story 3. Um, and I, honestly, I think that resonates more strongly than I originally thought. Uh, it, it does take these people we've been watching for however many years... Uh, between either movie, and puts them in perils that we never expected them to be in and takes us to emotional depths we perhaps never expected to be brought to with this cast of characters. And it goes to those dark places, and do they come out of it? I guess you have to see the film. Uh, no, I, I'm kidding. I mean, we, we, we bring out and we have a future to look forward to, even if it's not the future we're comfortable with. Yeah, I like that. I, do too. I I really liked this movie. I wouldn't say I loved it. Um, I think I liked the other two Guardians movies better, but I would also be willing to accept that this might be a better made movie. I actually think that's very... Yeah, uh, on both counts I agree. I liked the second Guardians movie more than this movie. I like Guardians of the Galaxy 2 more than a lot of movies. Um... um but I recognize that's for personal reasons. I think this is a better movie. Well, and you and I have said many times on the podcast, especially if you guys watch our Two Nerds Don't Go to the Movies, we don't really do 
sad movies anymore. I went through a very long phase. I hesitate to call it a phase because it was so long, where I wanted those dark, uncomfortable experiences. And it's still something that I do enjoy in media. It hasn't been that many years since I watched BoJack Horseman. Uh, but I like to be in the right headspace to watch those anymore. I um, mean, for me, it was the pandemic. Uh, just to be perfectly blunt, it killed my enthusiasm for watching just like sad dour shit the world is awful um and i don't watch movies to be reminded of that (laughs) uh i am in a constant state of emotional vulnerability and i don't need to be brought any lower thank you very much uh but this movie ultimately was still it was still a guardians movie right and that's the point i was i was trying to build to is that you know while i would say it is nowhere near as fun or adventurous or epic as the first two movies or even as dark as they were, uh, uh, Infinity War and Endgame, it is still a fun movie. It, yeah, there's still there's fun still to be had. Bits and jokes, and these and there's and these characters are still comedically entertaining. Um, there are still funny like scenes. There are still a lot of good times to be had. But the movie doesn't shirk from the fact that it's not always all good times. <laughs> Um, another observation I think that you brought up that I would like to agree with here. I think this would have been better as like a mini series. I think most movies would be better as mini series. Not all. In some cases, the tight one and a half, two two and a half hour time frame is is the right length to tell a particular story. And if you add more fat, um, it becomes like an engineering problem. A thing isn't done when you can't add anything in. A thing is done when you can't take anything out. Uh, but that's some movies. I think most movies would probably be better as series. <laughs> uh, I don't know that I necessarily agree with that, but I think this movie would have been better as a series. I would have liked, especially as a last hurrah, more time to say goodbye, I guess. Yeah. Um, but in terms of filmmaking, there was a lot of stuff I really enjoyed. There were a lot of uh, layers to the storytelling. Um, this is perhaps one of the most well adapted intros I've seen in film and I'm speaking of uh, Rocket Walking Through Nowhere listening to um, Creep by Radiohead just quietly singing along Mm -hmm. it it basically tells you the plot of not only his entire backstory uh, how he feels about the situation how other people feel uh, specifically the villain of the film the uh, high evolutionary feels about him and the journey we're about to take. I, it is so singularly a ridiculously perfect song choice and portrayal. James Gunn is good at those. I, this was a film where I wasn't hot on the whole soundtrack. Some of it felt very some crammed it, in. Some of it felt a little like the term. Mm-hmm. Like I, I, I mentioned it before. I don't really have a problem with needle drops in movies. Good song, good. I don't get the issue, but. Some of these kind of like, they started it, and then you got like four seconds of that song, and I get sort of thematically why you do that because the feel good music is is like this movie's not supposed to you know it's it's withholding that from you. It's like hey everything might be all right. No, nope. no nope, everything's not all right. Shit's still going wrong. Um, and that way when, when they do the, when they do finally get the big payoff moments, it feels good. But also I don't, it felt a little bit like being in a car with someone who keeps switching the radio station and won't fucking stop it. Mm. (laughs) Or for you young people who don't know what that is, uh, the TV channel. Or for you young people who don't know what that is, uh, if you give someone the aux or like the Bluetooth connection to the car and they, they're, they, they get it taken away. (laughs) um i I feel like parts of the editing in this film were questionable uh as i've been doing violent profiles i've been noticing editing a lot more than even i did before and there were a couple of cuts here that felt i don't want to say last minute but like well this is the best we're going to do Whereas I didn't notice any of that. The only weird editing thing I noticed is there's a scene right at the beginning where CGI Drax is very distracting. Well, that's <laughs> post-production more than editing. But, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> but, but the thing you talked about where they cut off your needle drop before yeah. it got good and then never returned to it for whatever reason. Right. That is editing. 
and, and well, I, I wonder I, again. I feel like that was an intentional choice. Uh, perhaps, but like I, it, it, it was so brief, and it, I don't know. It, it was strange. It, it uh, I don't want to say it took me out of the movie, but it made me ask questions before we moved on. It, it interrupted the flow. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and I, I, I feel like there was at one point a three-hour cut of this movie. I would speculate. Uh, can we get a bunch of internet artists to release to get that released? I would love that. Still waiting on that cat's butthole cut, by the way. If no, you guys could... no, no cat's butthole cut. This is fine. You stop fucking pushing the cat's butthole. Cut. I'm not gonna get it if they don't find it. Ah! <laughs> um, I think the only other real criticism I have about the film was um. I mean, there's the weird tonality. Uh, I don't I don't know if James Gunn is ever going to reach the apex of seamlessly blending stupid dick jokes with heartfelt moments as he did in the first season of Peacemaker. Uh, it doesn't always uh, ebb and flow right. Um, and it wasn't perfect here. And there was some of that. But it was like, whatever, you're watching a Guardians movie. Like, that's part of the buy-in, right? Yeah, and I'm not a guy who bitches about the MCU formula. And they definitely have one. Yeah. There's certain there's a certain ratio of like heartfelt moments and quips and action scenes that makes an MCU movie and uh, people online it feels like maybe 10 years ago at this point started to get real shitty about it and have only gotten shittier. Man, fuck you guys. <laughs> I mean, it's people don't uh people don't like seeing other people have fun with something they don't understand. I my, I myself included. The number of times you have looked at me and said, you know, like, God of War, and I get really angry because I don't know what that is. I feel it. I get it. But, like, maybe get off of Twitter. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) I have it. I'm a lot happier. Um, It's mostly Reddit, actually. Well, Reddit also. I'm off both. Uh, But um, there were some line deliveries that were a little wooden, mostly from Chris Pratt. And I don't say that as like a, ooh, Chris Pratt, because there were also some fucking amazing performances by him. Uh, He's a good actor. Yeah, he is a good actor. Um, and again, that might have been editing I, I, or directing. I don't know why that's the take we went with. A movie is such a multi-headed hybrid. Yeah. It's real hard to pin down what, sure. the, what the cause of any given thing is. Yeah. Um, but uh, it, this is a difficult movie to really even begin to criticize, at least for me. I, I feel like it did the stuff it intended to do excruciatingly well. It has heart and soul and... Uh, like nine right stuff walks. Yeah, I feel like it, if it came out later that James and Sean Gunn had a running bet going about how many right stuff walks James could fit into this movie. Um, I hope it was worth it, James. I hope I hope winning that bet because you definitely did. Uh, got you something worth it because boy howdy, he did a. Bunch and I loved all of them. I'm not even gonna. I'm not gonna. I love that. That's great. There, there was one where I was going, "Jeez, another right stuff walk. What the fuck?" But then, like the next one happened, and I was like, "Ah, I'm back in." Yeah, all right. You got me. <laughs> um, is there anything you want to talk about in particular? We talk in vagaries because you're not coming here to get a synopsis of the movie from us. Wikipedia exists, and if you are, please don't. I don't find that entertaining to make. Unless so, I was doing, like, a review video, like the classic movie review videos of the mm-hmm. internet. But, like, I'm not on, I'm not a YouTuber 15 years ago, so I'm not going to do that. Or a modern-day YouTuber desperately trying to cling to the past. Or still doing what made them popular and having a nice time with it. Either way, yeah. I'm not that guy. I don't find those fun to make, so I'm not going to do that most right, of the time. Right, right. I do ep- we do episode by episode stuff for like the series we watch because that's just a great structure. Um, this movie is is there's you know um, there's something I did want to speak about specifically. Um, this movie has the single most hateable villain the MCU has had since the actual Nazis, like <laughs> the even high then those Nazis weren't that bad. They were, like, still Nazis. Yeah. They, like, at least... Like, if they didn't occasionally remind us they were Nazis, it would have been like, ah, enemy soldiers. I wonder what their deal is. We're Nazis. Oh, yeah, shit. Right, right. You are deplorable. Okay, right. I keep forgetting that. Yeah, I mean, I'll kill you. That's fine. Yeah. Uh, But, like, the the beginning of the MCU, they, they murked everybody. 
This has been the, the, the MCU villain who has deserved death most in a long time. I hate this motherfucker more than I dislike Thanos. Because Thanos at least has swag. This Rizless, uh, petty little sadist. This f fucking evolution incel um, is <laughs> the most hateable little shit. Kudos to the actor who played the High Evolutionary. You did a Joffrey tier good job. I, Spectacular. I hated that guy. And Rocket, at the end of the movie, this is a humongous spoiler, lets him live. And that is personal growth, and I understand that he's, you know, he's evolving into uh, the kind of guy who can lead the Guardians of the Galaxy. Blah, blah, blah. Someone should have shot that motherfucker. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I don't remember where I saw this online. Um, I believe they have... Either it has been the case in the comics, they retconned it in the comics, they retconned it for the movies and didn't talk about it a lot, whatever. Uh, I, I had read at some point that uh, the High Evolutionary is supposed to be a Kang variant. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I've read that somewhere, too. Uh, given current situations, which I hope resolve themselves... Yes. Um... However, is most good and just. <laughs> uh, if you need a different actor to play Kang, you got a good one. And one who's much better at being hateable. <laughs> He's, he, he does like a, a, a villain's uh, checklist of mean, hateful tropes. I don't, I don't like Thanos because I think he's boring. I'll be perfectly honest with you. He's, he's less cool Darkseid, and Darkseid looks like an idiot. He looks like a big blue dildo. Uh... But, like, the rest of the MCU villains, for the most part, are cool. They're, like, they have a point of view. They have a, as uh, Willem Dafoe said about uh, the Green Goblin in Spider-Man No Way Home, they have a case to make. Yes. They have a moral outlook. Uh, Thanos, for, the, the, the MCU Thanos, actually, I like a lot better than comics Thanos. Because oh, he, yeah, I'll agree with that, too. He's, he's a much more interesting character than comics Thanos, who is just a simp. Um, but, like, he's a terrible person. Sure. Uh, he's a genocidal maniac. Yeah. They don't call him the Mad Titan because he's angry. He's crazy. But he has a case to make. It's wrong, but it's not petty. The High Evolutionary is a petty little sadist. He has no... He, he talks a big game about how he has all these higher aspirations. But that's not what he's doing. And the movie makes this clear. This is not me reading into this. Rocket directly says this to him. You didn't want to make things better. You just don't like things the way they are. I, I, honestly, and that was a great delivery. but um, And a good line. And good in the moment. The point where he's talking to Star-Lord... And he's doing his grand plan, and Star-Lord's like, man, the last thing I need is to hear another narcissistic villain tell me his uh, great reasons for conquering the world. And he comes back with, I don't want to conquer it, I want to perfect it. And that moment where he absolutely misses what Star-Lord yeah, is saying... Just a completely over... The, the point sails a mile over <laughs> his stretchy head. Um, <laughs> that is perfect, because he's, he's just an abuser. He's just a petty sadist uh, who's a, who wants to control every aspect of, of everyone around him and likes to watch people hurt. And that, he's... The only... I'm, I'm trying to think of a different example for this than the one I used years ago because it's not... Oh, it's not really applicable anymore. But the evil wizard who, like, wants to destroy the world, can be a much less effective villain than a shitty mayor who just wants to watch you, specifically, protagonist, suffer. And is willing to be as petty and bureaucratic and mean as they need to be to get that to happen. That can be a much more effective villain, because it's sure. more personal. It's sure. on a scale that we have context for. Yes. Uh, and especially when the heroes um, are being reasonable. And that in the face of that, you just get a, uh, no, screw you. 
Yeah, I, 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 the other thing I loved is he's this amazingly well done villain, but his scale is definitely lower than the Guardians have fought before. Like they fought sure. Ego, the Living Planet, uh, who threatened dozens of planets everywhere in the you know, in the whole universe, uh, tried to turn everything into him, and then fucking Thanos. This guy is chump change for the Guardians of the Galaxy. And they treat him as such. I mean, you could even argue that uh, Ronan was a larger scale villain. I would say he's about equal to Ronan. Uh, Ronan was ultimately just a crazy terrorist. Sure, he was leading an army. <laughs> of or, crazy uh, terrorists. With intent to conquer. Whereas this guy was just kind of screwing around in his own little corner of the universe. That's fair, that's fair. <laughs> but, like, this is chump change to them. And they treat him as such. He's not... A big, you know, important threat that they have to take out. He's just in their way. Because he decided to come... He decided he wanted the smoke. And it turns out he didn't want the smoke. Um, <laughs> and I love that. I love that they don't... That none of the actual Guardians... Uh, and they have a few characters who aren't like, you know... The, the resurrected time, resurrected however you want to put it, Gamora... And the various other people they talk with treat the high evolutionary like someone to be afraid of. And all of the actual guardians treat him as, yeah, whatever. I mean, when we get to this loser, we're gonna we're gonna fucking dunk on him because that's what we do. Yeah. And then they just do that. <laughs> to a great extent, they just sort of beat his ass. Um And speaking of beating ass, that was another thing I really liked about this film is that everybody had at least a moment, and usually in tandem seconds between really great fight scenes, to look awesome. And it was usually using their own unique strengths, and, uh, you know, whether that be of character or, you know, shooting, sorting, whatever. Powers, abilities. Mm -hmm. um, I loved how in sync all the Guardians were. Yeah. It was clearly they were a well-established, well-oiled unit. They finally started, they finally wore the fucking uniforms! The Guardians' uniforms! <laughs> Uh, I'm not as hot on those. I think they look okay, but it was cool to see them. It's in the same way that I don't necessarily love the, like, some of the comic book accurate X-Men uniforms, but if I'm going to watch an X-Men movie, I want to see them in them. It's not about it that I really love the uniform. It's that I, I love the respect to the source material of sure. them doing the thing. Even in the Luke Cage series, him stunting on his original outfit. Yeah, I love that. Put him in it, though. That was, that they, was they good. They put him in yeah. it for one scene so that we could all look at it in live action and go, wow, you're right, they definitely shouldn't be wearing that mm -hmm. ever again. Yeah. And then they moved on, but they did the thing. <laughs> they did the thing. Um... Was there anything else you wanted to cover as we wind down? No, podcast? I just really wanted to shout out the villain because he did such an amazing job yeah. in making me hate him. Yeah, really spectacular. Um, well, what did you think about Adam Warlock? You're the Adam Warlock guy between the two of us. Um, I think they went away with it. Um, Adam Warlock is honestly treated pretty seriously, and he's an important figure in several, like, many, many, many moons ago, before, even before my time, um, Marvel stuff. He's, you know... In, he's in the comics a fairly serious and important figure and he was very much a comedic figure in this he's a, a doofy moron who also happens to be very powerful he spends most of the movie as the poop shoot but he earns that because his first 10 minutes of screen time are him just absolutely beating the shit out of every member of the Guardians of the Galaxy oh um. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I, I don't have a lot of frame of reference for the guy, so I didn't really have any thoughts. He seemed fine. I think it's a way to go. I'm not mad at it. Yeah. Uh, it's definitely more comedic than I expected. But then again, I kind of expected him to get introduced as a villain. But introducing him, if not directly in opposition to, but at least in relation to the High Evolutionary, is again, just great respect for comics history. Because I believe they retconned out that particular connection or direct sort of thing many moons ago um well uh if i if i may i do have one parting absolutely thought. um i realized this uh, uh spoilers uh, i realized this about a day before we went to see the movie and it was one of those realizations that was like i'm sure you've had those before where you put the pieces on something together and you go no it couldn't be I'm sure you've seen it in movies and TV shows where the heroes do that. I'm the hero here, I guess. 
Um, there is one thing I learned most importantly about this film, and that is to trust James Gunn. Um, I say that, and there should be an incoming scandal any minute now where he's a horrible monster. I'm hoping not, but, you know, that's just how life likes to hand me some lemons sometimes. But, uh, at least as a filmmaker, I should trust James Gunn. Um, he hasn't steered me wrong so far. There's only two of his movies that I haven't seen. Um, and, uh, every time he manages to pick up the little things and do good things with them and... Whether that's, like, actually giving Ratcatcher and Polka Dot Man, and, I mean, Peacemaker for that matter, some really amazing interpretations and screen time, or um, just everything about uh, the sense of loss and, and dealing with one's own flaws and, you know, the found family tropes that you and I both love so very much. Uh, the man gave me an entire MCU series about Rocket. Yeah. Yeah. 